and what happened affected the life of just about everyone living in this country in the 1930s. Oh, it was in 1935. We'd be in school. All of a sudden, the wind had come up, and it gets so dusty and dark, you couldn't see. You couldn't see across the street. It was just like a big cloud settled down over Grantsville, only it was dust. We could see the dust clouds rolling towards Grantsville in just big black ugly clouds. Any time the south wind blew, you knew Grantsville was in for a, a good dusting down. And my <coughs> younger sister, and we used to cross the street to go to school, get a hold of hands, and we'd stand there and wait and wait and wait and think, well, now, is there a car going to come? And we'd listen and listen. You couldn't see unless, unless the cars they had their headlights on, they could see a little glow or glimmer. So we'd listen and we'd run across, was scared, didn't know whether we was going to be hit or not. I don't know about you, but it's hard to imagine not being able to see, to cross the street to get to school because of huge clouds of blowing dust. But it did happen right here in Utah in the 1930s, just over the western mountains from Salt Lake City in a town called Grantsville. I've heard a lot of people say they used to hang wet sheets over their windows and things like that to try and keep the dust from coming in their houses. And so I don't know, it was just really bad, that's all it was. According to the people who lived in Grantsville, they, they were just, uh, just being driven nuts by the dust. Uh, dust everywhere. You, couldn't, you can't protect any home, even the modern day home, from dust. I remember back in the, when I'd go to movies once in a while you get to go to a movie and they would always show a newsreel prior to the movie and they would always show the the dust bowl back in the middle west well we didn't need to look at that but dust bowl back there in the middle west all we had to do was look out the windows many days or just step outside and you could see the the movie was right there in your eyes and here you actually see one of the dust clouds that are causing such havoc Spreading over the countryside like a pall, it envelops everything. The black lizard that is turning our great plains region into a desert. News more important than anything else because it affects our food supply and the future of our farm country. From the panhandle of Texas to the prairies of the Dakotas, nature has cast this blight over much of America's greatest farming region. But the area is not yet lost to man. Even in the shaded sections, which are hardest hit, the situation is not hopeless. The danger of surrendering to nature's attack of drought and wind is obvious. The topsoil, the surface layer of earth in which crops grow, is being lost. First, drought dried up this soil, killing the crops. The land, left idle and bare, was baked by the sun and swept by the wind. As the moisture it drew from the subsoil was exhausted, the topsoil crumbled into fine particles of dust, lighter than sand. These the wind picked up, whirling the particles into the air, stripping the land of its productive topsoil. Today everyone asks, what can be done to save our soil? But the dust didn't blow only in Utah. Much of America's Great Plains region was devastated by the dust storms in the 1930s. Before this disaster, this area was known as America's breadbasket. Soon it was known as the Dust Bowl. April 14, 1935 is a day that will be remembered as Black Sunday. It was the day when strong prairie winds started blowing across the Great Plains, pelting small towns and big cities alike with tons and tons of the nation's richest topsoil. Car lights had to be turned on in the middle of the day, and for millions of Americans, daily life became miserable. Today we know what caused our soil to blow and turn a huge portion of our country into a dust bowl. Here's Michelle King from Two News to tell us more about it. The story actually begins in the 1920s, when farmers in the Midwest enjoyed steady, predictable rains, when new modern methods brought faster and more powerful tractors and other machinery that made it easy to dig up America's grassy prairies and put down wheat and other crops. Millions of acres were plowed under, and year after year, farmers took bumper crops from the soil. 
but they didn't realize what the cost of those bountiful harvests would be. They grew the same crops in the same fields year after year. They did little to put natural organic matter back into the soil. By farming in this way, they were slowly using up the plant nutrients like nitrogen in the soil, and their soils were getting lighter and less likely to hold water. Then in the middle 1930s, a serious drought hit much of America. The rains came much less often. Most farmers had no other way to water their crops. They could only plant their crops and pray, and then watch them wither and die, then try again. The drought lasted for at least three years in a row. Without moisture, the already overworked and underloved soil turned closer to dust with each pass of the plow. With no strong plant roots from grasses or farmers' crops, the dry soil simply started to blow away with the wind. News more important than anything else because it affects our food supply and the future of our farm country. Movie newsreels of the day captured the devastation of the Dust Bowl and its effect on the lives of the farmers that depended on the land that was flying out from underneath their feet. They had to do something. They had nothing to eat. They were blown out and stormed out and dusted out and they had to leave. Consequently, they loaded their wives and children and all of their belongings, including mattresses, on top of their jalopies and headed westward for California. More than a quarter million people packed their belongings. With cries of, California, here we come, they set out, hoping to find a better place. But what many of these immigrants found in California were fear, prejudice, and too few jobs for too many hopeful farmers. Many, no doubt, traveled west through Utah. And when they got to the Tooele Valley and near the small town of Grantsville, they found drought and dust much like they had left. And while Utah's Dust Bowl problem was every bit as bad as the one in the Midwest, its cause, at least at first, was different. People still remember what happened. You want me to tell you about the Dust Bowl? The Dust Bowl was caused by overgrazing in this valley due to the fact that we didn't have much moisture come after the sheep was all over here. Overgrazing did have something to do with it because just east of Grantsville they used to have a big shearing place there and they used to run an awful lot of sheep out on the desert and in those days they all trailed right through Grantsville. See they didn't have trucks or anything to haul them like they have nowadays. In order to protect the sheep, they wouldn't be able to shear them sometimes for a week or so because of this wet, stormy weather. And of course, the sheep would be out on grazing in this area. And a snowstorm come in, and they had to keep the sheep here for maybe a week or two, and they just took all the vegetation to walk. Uh, I understand that we're, uh, a lot of times, we're six to 7,000 sheep in this small area of, uh, you know, 10, 12 miles square. And so it really denuded the, the uh, vegetation. Then we had a dry year, and then we had a fire come down from up to Hickman and come through and take whatever was left. And that uh, depleted everything in the valley. What caused the, the Dust Bowl in the first place, to start with, it was overgrazed. But the main thing that caused it was the drought that we had back in those days and the wind. It seemed like it blew all the time. The farm and ranch families living in Grantsville in the 1930s suffered in the same way as those in middle America. For many, the drought and the wind dried up any hope that they had of holding on to their land and their way of living. Well, the land was uh, lost by a lot of people due to the fact they couldn't pay their taxes. And so the county had the uh, uh, took the land and then when they formed the soil conservation in 1938 the county give the land to the soil conservation to start uh, reseeding it and try and bring, uh, bring back the vegetation. Realizing something must be done to save what was left of America's farmlands, the United States Department of Agriculture formed the Soil Conservation Service in 1938. The purpose of the SCS, as it was known, was to assist farmers in learning new ways to use and improve their precious soil. Government experts taught the farmer how to revive and protect the soil. In a long-range conservation program, he was taught new ways of planting and plowing that would hold the moisture in the land when the rains stopped, that would keep it from blowing, 
when the winds came. Today, the seeds of hope planted in the Tooele Valley by the SCS more than 60 years ago continue to grow. Uh, this is crested wheatgrass was br uh, brought in here in, the, in about 38 uh, uh, planted due to the fact they said it would grow in an arid country. Utah's Dust Bowl area was reseeded. Irrigation systems were built. Local soil conservation districts were established all across the state. And after a lot of work and years of patience, the land began to be useful again. Today, the people who manage the Grantsville Soil Conservation District are still the primary protectors of the agricultural land in the Tooele Valley. It's their job to make sure that the practice of grazing livestock doesn't blow up in everybody's face. Uh, the decisions are made as to number of cattle, the type of planting, what pastures. These pastures are all rotated so that they're not overgrazed. Uh, sometimes uh, we've experimented with various grasses to find out which will produce the most forage and which will keep the soil stable and, and in a good thrifty condition. We lease the feed, not the land, we lease the feed out to the uh, Grantsville Grazing Association and then they tell us where they're going to put the cows and if we approve that then, uh, then that's the way they go. And that's the purpose of the soil conservation districts, not only this one here but the ones throughout the nation is to preserve this so that these people can uh, still provide food and fiber for the American population and actually for the world. If you were to visit the area around Grantsville today, you wouldn't have to look very hard to uncover evidence of those Dust Bowl days. In many places, blown soil still buries fence lines, and the white subsoil shows through the sparse growth of grass. Yet the Grantsville Dust Bowl days are fading from memory, but the lessons learned from those dark days will hopefully always stay with us. Well, the lesson we learned is, is conservation. Take care of what you have and improve it all the time. The farmers of America have fed this country and the better part of the world for a number of years, but it won't happen if we deplete our soils. Your food doesn't come from the grocery store, it comes from fields like this. And from fields like this, even though they don't look like there's much there, there's a lot of meat that comes off of those fields. Crops behind me are, are lush and beautiful because the ground has been cared for properly. The irrigation and water has been used wisely. This ground in front of me has been managed properly so as to harvest the grasses that are there in the form of meat. And uh, we just need to keep doing that. It has to happen doesn't happen, uh, we're all going to pay for it in the, in the form of hungry people. Hey, what you doing? Making my own gospel. Hey, what are you doing? Creating a windbreak. A windbreak? Yeah, it's one good way for keeping the soil from blowing away. To make a windbreak, all you need to do is plant a row of tall trees on the side of the field that the wind usually blows from. The wind hits the trees and has to go up and over. There's less wind near the ground, so dry soil doesn't blow away. But dryness isn't the only thing that can cause valuable soil to disappear.